The agenda this week heard Doug Ford's take on his brother Rob Ford, the former mayor of Toronto. Debated the trouble with Facebook and fake news and heard why Ontario's child welfare system is woefully dysfunctional. The agenda's week in review begins with a proposal by the mayor of Ontario's capital city to put tolls on the Gardner Expressway and the Don Valley Parkway. If you're the mayor of Brampton or the mayor of Vaughan or Oakville or Mississauga, whatever right now, what are you thinking about this road toll idea? Well, it depends. If you're the mayor of Brampton and you've sat in, in, in uh, Linda... Jeffrey. Jeffrey, thank you. And you've sat in cabinet for many years and you, and you were part of the debate on road tolls, you probably have a sympathetic view. Uh, I haven't seen her comment. I've seen Rob Burton from Oakfield has been supportive. Bonnie Crombie, also supportive. The mayors in Oshawa and the regional chairman in Durham, less so. So it's definitely going to be tricky for them. But I think they all recognize that there is a need, that there is a traffic congestion starting point here that is a dead end mm. for this town. And, and we saw Kathleen Wynne and the provincial government try to wrestle with this. And you mentioned Metrolinx. They were trying to figure their way around, around tolls and never had a very clear, resonant message. But we saw that, that Kathleen Wynne looked at polling, uh, sorry, at tolling, looked at the polls, and, and decided bail to bail out of, yep. out of uh, road tolls and went in, in the opposite direction of John Tory and sold off, started to sold, sell off part of Hydro One, mm -hmm. the opposite of what the mayor has done. Let me, uh, Karen Stintz, get you on that. If the numbers are right, most of the people paying these fees are going to be people who live outside the city of Toronto. So if you're a mayor representing one of those suburban communities, what do you think about all this? Well, and that's the reality. that They can think of anything they want, but they're not their roads. I mean, mm -hmm. just to be candid and not to be controversial, but, no. you know, at some point, um, I, if I were the mayor in an outlying area, I, I would then take the rallying cry to Metrolinx because I think from a, a regional perspective, the worst case scenario is every municipality implementing their own tolls. Hmm. I think that's not a good outcome for the region. But is this but, a political winner? Because I mean, in question no. period this morning, Patrick Brown and the Conservatives were up on this, even though it's not, it's not the province's decision. Yeah. But... It's a political drum but, by which. But the, understand, you know. but the, understand that if so, if someone from a municipality is paying revenue that's going to Toronto to build Toronto-based transit, mm -hmm. that's one less dollar they can collect for their own municipality for their transit needs. Mm -hmm. Except. That so at some point, it has to come together if we're really going to build an integrated transit system. If we just want to have a bunch of municipal transit operators, then maybe the best way forward is to have all these little municipalities putting their tolls in place. But I don't believe that that was the vision of Metrolinx, and I don't believe fundamentally that's what is, is going to help us break through our gridlock. Except that we're not asking people in Brampton to pay for Toronto schools. We're asking them to pay for Toronto roads that they use. So it is so a well, user is fee. It, is it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a user fee for both. I think we're going to see. I think it's just at the beginning stages. These are baby steps we're taking, baby steps. So look, at the. It, it, it's road pricing. It's something that, that, that progressive conservatives should be supporting, as John Tory is now. I don't know. I've never understood why the uh, provincial Tories are opposed to something where you ask people to pay for what they use. I wonder, though, if this is a problem you can ever solve, given that there's 100,000, even more, people moving into this city every year, and a lot of them drive, and a lot of them are going to continue to sit on the highways, and they'll pay their two bucks going in and two bucks going out. So the coffer, your coffers will be fuller with money, but the productivity is not going to get any better. The traffic is not going to get any better. Are you concerned about you see, that? that's kind of a defeatist attitude. I mean, I look at it and sort of yeah. say, well, if you adopt that approach, then you just do nothing. And I can tell you what would happen for sure is it would get worse and worse and worse, the traffic. And I know, given how bad it is now and given what people tell me about the economy and productivity, about their families who they don't see, about the environment uh, being de degraded by car traffic, that if we do nothing, it's a prescription, I think, for, you know, really hurting, injuring, if not killing the goose that laid the golden Egg, namely the successful city that is Toronto. And so the obligation to me is to act now. Successive city councils have approved all kinds of transit projects over the years and put them on this big list proudly and not spelled out how they're going to pay for them. So guess what? They never got built. We are about to open next year the first new transit station on heavy order transit in 14 years in a city that has grown by tens of thousands of people. That is not responsible, and I'm not going to preside over a city for as long as I am able to be mayor uh, that, uh, that operates that way. We're going to be honest. We're going to say to people, we've got to pay for this stuff. We have to do it and uh, get on with it. We talk mostly policy on this program, but uh, a little bit of politics, so let's talk a little bit of politics. Sure. Have you got the votes to get this through council? 
Well, I hope so, but that's well, my know, job. Do you know so yet? Well, no, but you never know anything until people push that button uh, in the city council chamber. You think you know, and uh, you know, I've had a lot of votes. They've said were the sort of you know the the, the big test of uh, my mayoralty and so mm -hmm. on. And you know, we've we've done okay on getting people to rally behind us, but we're working at this now. And uh, I'm optimistic, but I'm not going to sit here and declare certainty to you because there is no such thing. Uh, you need 23. Yes. How many votes do you think you've got? Well, I'm, I, I, I'm going to start telling you this now. <laughs> uh, enough, uh, I hope. But, you know, again, it, it is yeah. not like a majority government. For your viewers out there, they know municipal politics. There are no parties in, in our uh, city, in our, uh, in our city, I think not in Ontario. And so you have to go and collect those votes and, and, and uh, talk, persuade people, and I think that's healthy. Doug Ford, who will be on this program later, who ran against you in 2014 at the end, after the former mayor got too sick to run. He has said that he intended to run provincially in the next provincial election, but that you have so opened a door for him to run on an anti-toll platform, he will probably decide to challenge you instead and have a rematch in 2018. How do you greet that news? Well, uh, look, uh, Mr. Ford is going to have to answer the question of, uh, is he going to do uh, something about the transit and to fix the traffic? And if so, how is he going to pay for it? And all these kind of, I heard him last week musing about selling the portlands to pay for transit. Well, again, you can only sell it once, and I'm not sure if he's going to sell it before or after he puts the Ferris wheel there. You know, this would be a short-sighted, typical kind of off-the-cuff sort of answer. And I'm just saying to people, it's time for honesty. It's time to say, look, we have to build the transit to fix the traffic. We have to pay for it. I don't believe that massive property tax increases are the way to go. I don't believe selling hydro is the way to go. But he's going to have to answer some of those questions. I mean, he's a man that seems obsessed with running for public office, which is fine, I guess. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, if he wants to run, put his name on a ballot and we'll have a spirited debate. Here's an excerpt from the book. When Rob ran for mayor, we realized Ford Nation had become its own strategic voting bloc, even though we hadn't really planned that. Ford Nation, I believe, could quite possibly be the biggest bloc in Canada outside of any political party. There are roughly 340,000 people in Ford Nation. That's just in Toronto and doesn't count the hundreds of thousands of supporters in the 905, 705 and 519 area codes, not to mention the rest of the country. What do you think was the glue that kept that together, that coalition? You know, it's interesting, and, and going back to the, the election in the U.S., there's no Ford Nation card, per se. There's no registration. We, we have, you know, a massive list of emails and phone numbers, um, but it's just the average person fed up with uh, government spending. They want a more transparent and accountable government, and uh, they, they, just, they just want their voice to be heard. Our Ford Nation is such a diverse group. It's made up of NDP, of liberals, fiscal conservatives, all walks of life, from some of the wealthiest in the country to some of the poorest. And it's amazing how a staunch fiscal conservative would win the vast majority of every Toronto community housing uh, a building in, in the city. And Rob cared for those people. And they had the voice. Because a lot of these, the ethnic community came from countries that uh, there was a lot of corruption, a lot of interrogation, intimidation. And they came to Toronto and all of a sudden they had the mayor's home phone number. He's, he's the only guy that gives out his home phone number. It's, it's, it was staggering. As you looked at the American election campaign, did mm -hmm. you see echoes of your brother's campaign style in uh, Donald Trump? Um, uh, Donald Trump and Rob Ford are totally different people. Uh, the movement was similar. Um, the base was similar. But it's really, it's different in the U.S. At least what, what I see in the U.S., there, there's still, you know, the way I describe it, in Toronto, it's great. Everyone lives together. But for the most part, you know, it's really split up in three groups. This is my opinion, that there's a Hispanic population, incredible people, works, they're just such hard-working people. And then you have the African-American community, and then you have the white community, you know, working class and so on and so forth. And uh, here, it's not, it's not that case. With the ethnic community, um, you know, the African-American community did not support Trump whatsoever. I think 84 percent, roughly, uh, supported Hillary Clinton. You flip that around the other side, uh, Rob loved that community in, in, in Toronto, and they loved him. It's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. I'd, I'd love to study that one, one day. It's the most interesting group I've ever seen uh, gather. If you, you look at any Ford Fest or whatever, it's every culture you could possibly think of. It's like a melting pot 
Um, it doesn't matter, Eastern European, Asian, uh, you know, the, the black community, uh, you name it. It, it, it. I find it amazing. It's a, a snapshot of Toronto. There are a lot of echoes. Well, I shouldn't say a lot. There are some echoes mm -hmm. between Trump and Ford in as much as uh, well, they both come from well-off families mm -hmm. and, uh, and could basically say whatever the hell they wanted, and their base stuck with them. Uh, mm -hmm. That didn't seem to have a negative impact. And, of course, the, the media coverage, uh, you know, being quite intense. Yeah. You do. I mean, the two candidates did have that in common. You see they that. They did. Um, uh, the media was absolutely biased. Uh, you know, Steve, most media outlets are left, center to left. Um, I was at a media outlet uh, when Trump uh, won, and uh, you could just see it. People were, they were ready to jump off the, the building. And I, I thought, wow. That's what I thought. Wow, this is incredible. I knew they're left, but not this left. They thought, uh, they thought the world was coming to an end. We're learning how to navigate a very different information environment, and we're learning that it has a very dark side to it. Craig, if journalism were a patient, what diagnosis would you give it in 2016? Uh, I would say in some ways it's, it's a patient that perhaps is in rehab to a certain extent. Um, <laughs> the, the way it lived before uh, may change in the way it has to live now. And I, I think, you know, some people might use the words that it's in a crisis. Some people might say that, you know, we have to rethink everything. Um, there are a lot of fundamentals of journalism that still hold true and that are still important about being fact-based and evidence-based. But this world that I think was well described by that quote from President Obama has, has changed dramatically. And it's true that before someone might choose which newspaper to read on any given day and which television program to watch to get their news, when they get their news from Facebook, everything does kind of look the same. You don't necessarily see the source and the logos standing out to you. And so for people, what they're reacting to are the thumbnail image and the headline. And the more extreme those are and the more they appeal to your views and your beliefs, the more likely you are to click them. And that's changing the media environment drastically. And I think journalists have to think about how we reach people in that world. And also in particular, with Trump coming into power, how we deal with a leader who consistently says things that are not true. Hmm. Zainab, build on that if you would. What has gone wrong with the way we get and consume information? Well, to point out the obvious, I guess, that this is building on a simmering of mistrust in all institutions, and it's a failure of politics. So it predates the internet, to speak. It, you know, it starts with cable TV, perhaps. It starts with failure of electoral democracies to represent their population's interests. It comes, uh, what happened, though, is that in the simmering bed of discontent and existing failure of institutions and gatekeepers, as uh, Jay was saying, we have poured gasoline through this ecosystem, uh, especially social media. We're talking platforms like Facebook. We're talking platforms like Twitter to some degree. For example, Facebook's motto is to strive for an open and connected world. Well, any historian would tell you, open to what? Connecting whom? You know, that's not something that's obviously good. It's not even neutral. So what we have perhaps opened up ourselves to is a lot of um, ethnic hatred. We have connected people who are white supremacists. We have in places, uh, you know, I know everybody likes to discuss uh, United States and Europe, but in places like Myanmar, formerly Burma, BuzzFeed just had a report on how Facebook was helping fuel uh, viral misinformation that fed into existing ethnic cleansing. So what ha needs to happen here is the open and connected is not this neutral value. And it also needs to recognize that it's not just the information ecosystem that's failed us. The failure is feeding on global discontent, failure of elites, failure of democracy, existing authoritarianism and it's just pouring gasoline on this existing fire. It's a very tough situation. Hmm. Uh, Janice and John, I wanted to let our American friends go first because certainly I think it's the view north of the border that they are in the midst of an existential crisis down there when it comes to all of these issues. And I guess I want to get a sense from you two whether that's the case here in Canada. Janice, you first. The existential crisis? Not <clears throat> sure. I mean, first of all, you know, these are huge issues that we are kind of piling on the shoulders of journalism. You mm -hmm. know, in journalism, 
you know, and let's separate that a little bit from the journalism industry, which we can, you know, we can chat about. But in a lot of ways, journalism has has never never been healthier. Journalists have more tools at their disposal. They have better they have uh, better avenues to investigate. They are doing data crunching, the kind of work that you know that 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 Craig is doing in terms of investigating is being able to you know pour information. Or, uh, you know, information out there uh, for the public, you know, to uh, to be able to consume. So that's, you know, that's one part of it. It is this completely unfettered world of information that that disguises itself, puts on this costume of journalism that is really that is really uh, so much of a problem. And you know, and as journalists, it's our I think it's our job to to you know stand back from that and obviously investigate it. But I don't think we have to carry the entire burden of all of this. And I should just say, before going to you, John, that uh, I didn't mean to suggest that Craig had suddenly taken out American citizenship, but he is down there in New York right now, so I, I sort of wanted to let our friends on satellite start first. But where would you follow up on that, John? Yeah, I, well, first of all, I'd agree entirely with uh, Janice, but I, I, I would add a couple of things. First of all, the United States is unique. It's a unique political culture, always has been, and it's a unique media culture. And we shouldn't be terribly shocked that we've ended up in this place or that America has ended up in this place. This is the country that thrived on conspiratorial news in the 19th century. It was the country that gave us Rosewell. It was the country that created the National Enquirer. Uh, so we're seeing a continuation of that at an extreme now because of digital technology. And with that in mind, I, I, I would say we don't face a crisis of journalism globally, although there are parts of journalism that are in, in crisis. We have a crisis of engineering. Uh, this is an engineering problem. What does that Lar mean? This is largely driven by Facebook and Google. And they're aware of this. They have created algorithms that determine what we read, what we see atop our feeds or on our home screens. And for the most part, algorithms make our lives better. They make them a lot of things way more convenient. But the, the challenge that we collectively face and the engineering giants uh, critically <coughs> face is that these algorithms increasingly are being written uh, through machine learning. They're being crafted mm. by robots. It's not even human driven anymore. And these firms, they know this, have to come to grips with but surely this hum challenge. Human values are being used to program these things. Are, no? Initially, mm. initially, the humans start this, but the machines learn from our habits and they, they ad adapt or modify the algorithms for mm. each of us as we just continue. Every time we use our phones, mm. a machine is learning that we like this or that, or that people like us. But it also comes with a great risk, which is, I think, what we're trying to wrestle with uh, here. Let us go through some of the numbers that we alluded to off the top here, because they are distressing, to say the least. This is a reference to the disproportionate number of black and indigenous children in your care. For example, 42% of children in the care of the Children's Aid Society of Toronto in 2013, the last year for which figures are available, were black or had one black parent, and yet only 8% of people under 18 in Toronto are black. Continuing, 23% of Ontario children in care are First Nations, and yet only 2.5% of people under 18 in Ontario are First Nations. The rate at which white children are investigated, their family situations, it's 54 per 1,000. The rate at which black children are the subject of an investigation, 75 per 1,000. The rate at which Aboriginal children are investigated, 126 per 1,000. I think we need to start by just understanding why that is. Mary, start us off. Well, don't that, and, and I should preface this by saying, you don't need to give me 10 reasons, because if you give me 10, we got nothing left for anybody else here. So just start us off. Okay, well, there are at least 10 reasons. I'm, I'm sure. I think that, um, uh, that I'll maybe start with the historical piece, and that is that the child welfare system in Ontario has been in place for well over 100 years now, and really it has its roots in um, an approach to uh, caring for children that has come from uh, a colonization approach where uh, it's, it's really been an approach of um, we are here to take care of you and we can take care of you uh, in a good way and, and not recognizing that the communities that uh, some of these children are coming from, Indigenous communities mm -hmm. and uh, African-Canadian communities, um, have lots of reasons and lots of capability of taking care of their children, but maybe would do it in a different way. 
and therefore not seen to be as, as good a way. Um, and so I think over the last several years, really recognizing that, um, that we need to be listening to more, hearing from, and, uh, and assisting families from the Indigenous and African Canadian groups to better take care of their own children. Ken, what would you add to that? You know, the, the existence of so many Indigenous kids in care is not an accident. It is, uh, it has been, in fact, the case uh, since child welfare in the 50s uh, made its business the Aboriginal child. So we're not dealing with a new phenomena. These children uh, come into care for different reasons, as Mary says, but uh, there are uh, some fundamental realities. One is the Aboriginal child, statistically, is in the most distress of any Canadian child. And, you know, th that bears itself out in almost stati any statistical measure. Recent studies in, in child welfare particularly show a very strong correlation between children in poverty, for example, children from one-parent families, children who are really uh, don't live the kind of Canadian dream that uh, many people expect uh, our children to live in, in fact, live in a continuous, sta a continuous state of distress. So, so poor housing, that reality, poor education... Uh, all, all of, of that, above. and all of that correlates strongly with how, why children come into care. Um, there is other elements associated with it. You know, the child welfare system itself is based on a kind of forensic approach where we actually look at families uh, to, to really determine all the deficits in that family. And sometimes, you know, there are strengths in that family that you have to have a strong understanding of what you're looking at to be able to decipher. So I think there's been a lot of misdiagnosis, misassessments of Indigenous kids. There's, uh, many of us would, might call that a kind of a, a prejudicial approach that, uh, where you only look for information that uh, reinforces your beliefs. And a lot of the beliefs about Indigenous children are that they need to be rescuing. That goes back to colonial times, goes back to the turn of the century with Duncan Campbell Scott and all those folks who sought to assimilate the Indigenous child. So, uh, you, you know, these things kind of work in concert. They're systemic. They, they find themselves, though, um, at uh, one child, uh, one social worker, and uh, a lot of weight and a lot of complexities to sort out. At the end of the day, because child welfare being what it is, the apprehension of our children seems to be the preferred mode. In fact, mm -hmm. up until recently, it was the only mode by which child welfare delivered services. Mm -hmm. So you look at a family in poverty, in distress, inheriting some terrible colonial dynamics, and the final cap on that connection between Canada and that child is to remove them from their home. And Understood. that's a Canadian tragedy. Understood. Mahesh, what would you add to that list? That really, one of the things that we need to pay attention to is the difference between short-term and long-term risk. And so when we bring kids into care, sometimes we're just focusing on that short-term risk to say we're solving a problem of poverty or we're solving a problem of discipline in the immediate nature but you introduce very serious long-term risks in terms of people being separated from their families and their communities and, and missing out on, on critical attachments and really always weighing the balances of those two risks and landing in a place that focuses on families. Like As children's aid societies, we do fundamentally believe that children belong at home, that they belong in their communities, and that's how we should be working. Um, Unfortunately, as, as both Mary and Ken have said, we've, we've worked in a system where you know, the simple solution of bringing kids into care to manage risk is what's been done rather than pra practicing prevention. Ika, I want to go to you next because you were the lead on a report called One Vision, One Voice. Mm -hmm. Let's start to understand what that was about. What was the mission of that report? Well, the mission was to, I think, first and, foremo first and foremost, hear from the community and understand what they would have to say about their experience in child welfare. The community being who? Sorry, the African-Canadian community, the black community in Ontario. Um, and so a mix of service users and people who, s who support service users and just sort of, you know, even people that haven't had service with child welfare, we wanted to hear what they had to say about how child welfare has impacted the lives of, of African-Canadians. So that was the, the first piece. And then the second piece um, around the report was to then, based on what they said, uh, create a, or construct um, a way of doing our work um, and make recommendations to the system in, in terms of child welfare to do things differently so that we would see different outcomes. Were so, you prepared for what you heard? Um, I, I mean, I think there were some surprises. Such as? Uh, such as the idea that whether you live in Toronto or you live in Ottawa, or you live in Thunder Bay, or you live in Windsor, you have a very similar experience in relation to how systems 
um, interface with with you mm -hmm. as an as an African Canadian. So, you know, to hear very similar stories about um, about the school system, about the police, about the healthcare system, and about uh, you know child welfare uh, agencies was really surprising. The, the level of consistency, um, and so I think, and, and I so, so I think what it points to is the the fact that there are systemic issues for that are also a part of the story as to why the overrepresentations happen all over the province of Ontario. <laughs> all over the province of Ontario. And I think it goes back to some things that Mary talked about, some things that Ken talked about in terms of, you know, the history of African Canadians in Ontario, um, going back to before slavery and then slavery and then, you know, the aftermath of slavery around sort of legalized discrimination um, and legalized processes of, of uh, exclusion um, and disenfranchisement. And so, you know, our numbers are not what they are um, simply because of the things that happen in child welfare, but also because of how the community interacts and interfaces with mm -hmm. a number of other systems. I want to find out off the top how much of Jane Jacobs and her theories and her mission informs what you do right now. Well, I would say that, um, you know, I'm a student of Jane Jacobs. The very first planning book I read, um, if you can even call it a planning book, was <laughs> Death and Life of Great American Cities. And that was the moment when I kind of said, aha, um, there's something actually very rich and dynamic um, about the way she was thinking about and talking about cities. And it's really important to note that it's not something that's static. It's People always say, oh, have we applied her ideas here? Well, her <laughs> ideas are actually, they're very dynamic. They're a set of principles that can manifest in a whole variety of different ways. So I would say that the um, culture of the city planning department, the principles that we date bring to our everyday practice are entirely rooted in the thinking and the training that both myself and subsequent chief planners in the city of Toronto, who were in fact very good friends of Jane Jacob, mm -hmm. uh, have had. So her legacy is, um, you know, it's, it, it's deep and it's broad and it touches a whole variety of facets about how we think about urban and city life in the city of Toronto. Peter, let me get your take on that. Do you think Jane Jacobs was right about how cities ought to be planned? Uh, well, that's a complicated question. I think she was half right, but I think uh, part of the problem with Jane Jacobs is that she was uh, overly focused on aesthetics, on things like small streets and uh, and uh, varied sizes of buildings, and and that's all well and good. And you know, I, I grew up two blocks away from uh, where Jane Jacobs wrote *Death and Life*, uh, right on Hudson Street. Um, and you know, it is a beautiful neighborhood to grow up in. But when you focus uh, solely on these kind of aesthetic factors that uh, that make up a neighborhood, you you miss the economic component. And uh, I think that was a big failing of Jane Jacobs. And so when you look at the West Village now. Uh, where Jane Jacobs wrote that book and what she used as, a, as an example of the kind of perfect American neighborhood, only millionaires and billionaires can really afford to live there. Uh, so without that economic critique, uh, Jane Jacobs' kind of thinking is very limited, in my opinion. Just flesh that out a little bit for us, Peter, because when you say she's half right, obviously you think she's half wrong about something. What's the economic component that you think she missed? Uh, well, I think death and life kind of ignores uh, the need to protect cities from gentrification, essentially, what we now call gentrification, uh, and what Jane Jacobs might have called success. I mean, she, she was the one that said that uh, the greatest threat to a neighborhood is its own success. So when a, when a neighborhood does well because it has those, those aesthetic features, those, those varied buildings, those small streets, those trees, those parks, um, when it does well, when, uh, when that attracts people, what that ends up doing is privileging those who can afford uh, to uh, move into that neighborhood and who appreciate those features of a neighborhood. So without, the, without protections for the poor, without things like rent control or rent regulation, um, you're really uh, inevitably going to have the nice neighborhoods, the uh, Jacobs favored neighborhoods become the rich neighborhoods. Would you agree, Jennifer, that Jane Jacobs may have missed the bus on this one? Well, uh, Jane has such an incredible body of work that I think it's really important to look at that entire body of work and understand her thinking through, through that body of work because uh, she wrote a lot about um, the economies of cities and the complexity of the economies of cities and in fact, uh, was one of the early thinkers to actually recognize cities as having their own economy as opposed to being a subset of a larger economic context. Uh, but she also um, inherently advocated for diversity. I think that's something that's often in some ways misunderstood or misinterpreted. The granularity uh, that comes with making a great place is 
connected to a whole variety of different types of diversity, both in terms of how people move, but also in terms of housing typologies, also in type in terms of different tenures and really and incomes too, I presume. And incomes, of course. So mm -hmm. the best manifestation, I think, of Jane Jacobs thinking, the, the absolute best example that we have in the Toronto context is in fact St. Lawrence neighborhood, which of course has also stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. You know, 45 years later, it's an area that is not gentrified. Right. Uh, it was built to lift people out of poverty, and guess what? It's done exactly that. Uh, it was also built to be a dynamic, walkable place that had a strong sense of community, an integration of uses, and an integration of a whole variety of people from different socioeconomic strata. So if we see that as a manifestation of those ideas, I think it's a pretty good counterpoint to the argument that she forgot a big piece. Uh, there are not many places, I think, um, in the world that you can actually say have done such a good job at getting all of the critical pieces, the mix right to deliver a community where people can thrive. And St. Lawrence neighborhood right here in the city of Toronto is a great example of that. At the same time, the two kings, King Parliament and King Spadina, are areas where Jane's ideas were applied, taking away the zoning restrictions, allowing for the market economy to really drive revitalization. And those are areas where we need public policy now to come in and put the brakes on what's happening precisely because of the success of those ideas. And that is the Agenda's Week in Review. You can see all of those conversations in their entirety at tvo.org and on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.